My name is Jim Wades. I think uh, as most of you have probably uh, heard me on here before on, on other topics. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the, I guess what you might call an overview of the history of telegraphy. It's a very deep and complex subject, so we're not going to, you know, tell you everything about the history of telegraphy, but hopefully offer you some interesting insights and maybe explain some things that are commonly misunderstood and uh, maybe uh, reveal some uh, parallels to our current times that perhaps you haven't considered. And uh, so hopefully you'll leave here uh, with some, uh, some kind of interesting insights. So I'm going to start right away here because uh, for some of us, uh, particularly those of you on the East Coast and the Eastern Time Zone, uh, this, these run, run a bit late. So let me share my screen here. And uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. I think this is what I need to do. PowerPoint. Okay, and then let's see here. Slideshow. And from the beginning. There we go. Can everybody see this okay? Yes, looks good. Ex excellent. Okay. Uh, this uh, program uh, I developed a, a good number of years ago. Uh, yeah, on behalf of the Morris Telegraph Club. Uh, Morris Telegraph Club uh, is actually a, a, a nonprofit historical and educational association. It, it started in uh, 1943 as a fraternal organization for men and women who had retired from the telegraph industry and gave them an opportunity to maintain their, their friendships and acquaintances. Uh, they would, uh, chapters would gather uh, every uh, every April on Samuel Morris's birthday, and they would have big banquets and, and, and so forth. And uh, over the years, it's evolved into a histor uh, an historical and educational association that's dedicated to preserving the history of telegraphy, uh, the traditions of the telegraph industry and telegraphers. And we do a wide variety of things, so one of which, of course, are programs like this. Uh, on the history of telegraphy, we design and build uh, uh, historically correct uh, museum exhibits for public museums. Uh, we provide uh, technical advice, uh, even information for genealogical researchers. We maintain a, an archive of historic telegraph instruments, documents, ephemera, um, and uh, it's not uh, open to the public, but uh, it's uh, essentially uh, um, uh, an archive of uh, many different telegraph documents. And uh, some of the photos and, and so forth in this program actually come from those archives, a few of them anyway. Uh, so uh, this is entitled, Can Stout Send Lightnings, which of course is a reference to Job uh, 38, verse 35. Uh, this was sort of adopted by telegraphers uh, to uh, uh, maybe bring a little bit of divine uh, approval uh, to their profession. And so, uh, particularly in the 19th century, when, uh, when that was really a, a, a centerpiece of, of our culture and our heritage. So what I'd like everybody to do is kind of uh, take a step back in time and give some thought as to what the world was like before telegraphy. In fact, you know, information could really move no faster than it could be conveyed uh, by an individual or on horseback or on ship. Communications was slow. Um, it might take, you know, a month for information to move across the country. It could only move across the sea as carried by a, a ship or a boat. Uh, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the steam era in its early infancy, uh, things such as rail transportation were extremely dangerous. Um, there was no standardized time. Uh, there was no way to create a timetable. There was no way for a train, for example, to report that it was broken down. Uh, collisions were common. Um, really, uh, there were no safe ways to dispatch trains. Things we take for granted today, for example, stock markets, commodity exchanges, um, the Federal Reserve System, etc., uh, were impossible to operate uh, outside of a, uh, say, a local basis before the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph really uh, transformed many of those institutions. 
uh, distributed utility systems were difficult or impossible to operate. So, you know, without the telegraph, you couldn't have had uh, petroleum pipeline distribution networks. Press syndication didn't exist. Um, electronic news gathering didn't exist. Uh, so really, it was the telegraph that created many aspects of our modern world. And we often forget that. Uh, today, people are you know, impressed that you can pick up a smartphone and you can day trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but in reality, it was the telegraph that transformed the New York Stock Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, the various you know, cotton exchanges and so forth into worldwide marketplaces, worldwide engines of economic development. Uh, it was the telegraph that began to homogenize society. Uh, it it uh, created news associations, Associated Press, United Press, International News Service. Uh, it began to transform our society from a society that was focused only on what happened locally in the small insular communities to a society that looked to a national scope. It looked to Washington. It looked to New York. It looked overseas. It began to perceive itself as not just part, people began to perceive themselves, not just as part of, say, a local community, but as, say, if you might say, a part of a nation, you know, part of a worldwide community. Uh, so many things we, we take for granted. Uh, you couldn't have a modern urban fire department before the telegraph. Uh, the difficulty of transmitting alarms, uh, notifying uh, fire companies uh, that uh, there was a you know, fire in a particular part of a large urban area like Philadelphia or New York City uh, was very, very difficult to do. Uh, the telegraph made selectors and, you know, pull boxes possible. Uh, distributed manufacturing, just-in-time inventory. Uh, the things of this nature really are rooted in the development of the telegraph, the instantaneous communications, the distributed and what you might call remote control of uh, distributed manufacturing facilities. Uh, certainly diplomacy and war was transformed. If we look at, uh, we look at uh, a war, say, before the telegraph, the Roman general rode off. He, crossed the Rubicon, so to speak. The die was cast. He, he returned either victorious or defeated. Uh, but generally speaking, he was on his own. He had full authority to make decisions. He had full responsibility for those decisions. But with the emergence of uh, the telegraph, the early conflicts like the Crimean War, the US Civil War, et cetera, uh, the telegraph begins to politicize warfare uh, perhaps the most, you know, classic example, Abraham Lincoln, regularly injecting himself into the prosecution of the uh, Civil War, you know, the, the Grand Army of the Republic and so forth, uh, using the telegraph. And this trend continues today. Uh, you know, uh, a uh, naval officer can communicate directly with the White House. Um, permission for an airstrike. Uh, you know, there's a direct political connection now. Um, in terms of uh, both command control and communications, but also in terms of the political feedback through the press syndication process and so forth that exists in our society, uh, sometimes for better, in some respects, sometimes for worse. Uh, things like creating a weather map. You know, we take uh, for granted synoptic meteorology. Uh, uh, you could not create a weather map uh, before the telegraph. That was an impossibility. Uh, so you start to see certain sciences that are influenced and impacted significantly by instantaneous communication, synoptic meteorology, the ability to synchronize astronomical measurements, uh, things of this nature, right? So in, in, re, in my opinion, anyway, the internet is simply a mere refinement uh, compared to the revolutionary impact of the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph and the internet are very similar. The internet just operates a lot more efficiently and perhaps is just more intrusive. But the fundamentals of this process of homogenization, uh, the creating of what you might call the global village, really originates with the telegraph. And its impact on society really can't be uh, underestimated. 
Of course, uh, like many technology, the seeds of the electromagnetic telegraph are very simple. It was based on the concept of uh, electromagnetism. Now you have simply a, a battery or power source. You have a switch in the form of a simple telegraph key, the standard key, or as radio amateurs call it, the straight key. And of course, uh, an electromagnetic telegraph sounder. Okay, and this is a uh, creates a very simple simplex telegraph circuit. So in this particular diagram, um, you have simply a, a, a loop that is a power source, uh, two telegraph keys, and their associated telegraph sounders in a series circuit um, with battery and perhaps a ground return path. And uh, essentially, when no communications is being conducted, current is always flowing uh, through that loop Okay, and uh, the sounders are essentially uh, engaged. The electromagnetic magnets are energized within the sounder, and everything is quiet. Okay, and so in the at least in North American telegraph practice, the default standby or quiescent state of a telegraph loop was current always flowing through that loop. You might say it was normally closed. Uh, in the basic simplex telegraph circuit, then. Uh, what happens is when one operator has communications traffic, he opens his key, okay, and the electromagnets disengage, and then he can control the sounders in the simplex loop by manipulating the telegraph key, opening and closing that circuit in conformance with the dots and dashes. This is why if you look at many telegraph keys, uh, be it straight keys or fiberplex keys, they have a circuit closer on them. Contrary to popular belief, the origin of that circuit closer doesn't exist to tune your ham radio transmitter. It exists because in standard commercial telegraph practice, you had to have a circuit closer. When you're receiving communications traffic, your key is closed. That is, it's shorted out. Uh, if you wanted to say you miss a word or you miss you know, a group, uh, in a cipher uh, or a financial transaction, you would open your key or break the circuit. The transmitting operator sounder would stop reporting uh, or responding to the dots and dashes. He would know that you broke the circuit or a break, you might say. And uh, then, of course, he would close his key and await the fill. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this is where the term break. Uh, originates in in uh, radio communications. It's uh, a throwback, you might say, to the early days of, of telegraphy. If you look at some uh, computer keyboards, maybe even you have one in front of you, you will notice a break key on your keyboard. Um, not all computers have them now, but many still do. And the break key um, was carried in from Teleprinters. Teleprinters worked on the same principles as manual Morris circuits. And when you were receiving traffic by a teletype and there were garbles or other errors that occurred that couldn't be compensated for with a garble table or adjustment of a range finder uh, or a, a, a relay, uh, you would go ahead and break the circuit. When early mainframe computers emerged, they repurposed teletypes for communications. And of course, eventually developed, you know, for example, like the Model 33s and all. And to stop the spooling, if you will, the transmission uh, from the mainframe, you would break the circuit just like you do on a telegraph key. So when you see a break on your computer keyboard, a break key, that is a direct descendant of the circuit closer on a Morse key that may very well be like the one that sits on your desk that you use for ham radio purposes. But in its simplest form, the telegraph was just simply a simplex series loop in which a number of telegraph offices were interconnected, okay, perhaps on a railroad dispatcher's wire or on a wire uh, serving a local Western Union offices to a larger relay office and so forth, a very simple concept. And this was the foundation of our modern telecommunications industry, a very simple uh, concept. 
Now, of course, like all technologies, the telegraph industry grew and it evolved. And so uh, some complexity begins to emerge over time, as it does with any technology. And, and probably the most significant changes were technologies such as the duplex telegraph, uh, where two telegraph signals could be carried on a single wire. And then the quadruplex uh, telegraph uh, associated with Edison and so on, where you can send four telegraph circuits down a single wire, thereby multiplying circuit capacity and increasing the value of the capital investment in physical plant, pole line, you know, multi-pair cables, you know, underground cables, things of that nature in urban areas. And so uh, over time, telegraph companies, as more and more purposes were discovered for the telegraph, and more and more communications began to be carried by the telegraph, uh, and also in search of profits, okay, uh, technicians and engineers and inventors began to look for ways to multiply or increase circuit capacity. So we go to duplex, we go to quadruplex, then we develop things like carrier systems where you can multiplex telegraph circuits, where you use uh, basically a local telegraph loop, uh, transitions into say an audio frequency oscillator circuit. Um, and that audio frequency oscillator circuit is transmitted down a wire. And then of course there's a filter and demodulator at the other side. Uh, and uh, you can begin to put multiple telegraph circuits on a single carrier, be it a, uh, a, uh, a pair with transpositions and uh, good quality um, you know, noise rejection, common mode noise rejection and so forth. And eventually things like a microwave carrier for telegraph applications begins to emerge where you can have hundreds of telegraph circuits on a single RF carrier uh, between major uh, points. So there's an entire evolution that the telegraph industry goes through in search of greater and greater circuit capacity, greater and greater flexibility, the ability to handle more communications, traffic, uh, and so forth. And then, of course, uh, automation begins. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, concentrators, for example, automatic switching centers. And, and then, of course, we have the emergence of wireless telegraphy, which is a, you know, stems from the same tree. Okay, but uh, is obviously different in many respects. Uh, we're going to concentrate primarily on the telegraph industry here. So along with this complexity, of course, comes infrastructure. Uh, so uh, these are duplex circuits at uh, the Bourse building in Philadelphia, uh, AT&T. Uh, this photo was taken on July 11th, 1920. Just a very small portion of the telegraph uh, the infrastructure that was in place uh, and managed by AT&T. Now it's important to understand uh, that there are a number of large, what you might call telegraph utilities, obviously Western Union, uh, Postal Telegraph, Canadian National Telegraphs, Canadian Pacific, et cetera. But here's an interesting thing that most people don't understand. And that is one of the, uh, one of the big users of telegraphy, uh, uh, both as a commercial service, as well as for its own internal purposes, was the telephone company, okay? And so, for example, uh, telephone companies regularly used the telegraph for all of their internal communications well into the 1950s, even 1960s. And the reason for that is you could composite or superimpose telegraph circuits on voice long distance voice circuits, allowing the voice circuits to remain in revenue service well, the simultaneous telegraph transmission on the same circuit, of course, it was unheard by the people making long distance phone calls, but it could be used for things like testing and regulating uh, internal company business, things of this nature, or telegraph circuits that were available, available could be leased to large businesses, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, you know, things of this nature. Uh, so the phone company was ironically well into the post-war era one of the biggest users of telegraphy and uh, in many respects at least well into the mid 20th century the telegraph was much more economical uh, the reason for that is you could uh, per essentially convey a greater amount of record message traffic by a telegraph at lower cost than you could with voice communications. 
it really isn't until the emergence of microwave carrier uh, and you know uh, these types of newer telephone multiplexing techniques that you could you could go ahead and uh, you know compete uh, with direct dial long distance. Uh, a lot of you know people today, uh, younger people in particular, <laughs> probably have no concept of the uh, of the amount of effort that went into placing a long distance phone call in the 1950s or the 1940s. Uh, uh, call the local operator. The local operator fills out a toll ticket. They wait for an available copper circuit, transcontinental copper circuit. Uh, when it becomes available, maybe a half hour later, an hour later, they call you back and say, we have a circuit to Los Angeles. Uh, would you like to place your call now? It could take 20 minutes, a half hour, or even an hour to get a long distance telephone call. Whereas in the telegraph industry, one could uh, spin the little crank on a messenger call box, um, you know, write out a telegram blank, and it would be there very quickly via telegraph and typically at less cost. Uh, so the telegraph offered many economic uh, and infrastructure advantages uh, in, uh, you know, throughout much of its uh, history, at least the first, you know, 100 years or 125 years of its history. And literally telegraph infrastructure was everywhere, right? So any kind of important public place uh, by say the 1920s, 1930s, had telegraph circuits available. Uh, I used to sit in the press box at Tiger Stadium. Uh, you know, there were Western Union typewriters and Western Union telegraph circuits that were still there. And um, because the telegraph was so widely used, uh, there would be city halls and courthouses. And uh, as a matter of fact, for some years, Western Union had a a uh, motto, a core, an advertising motto, which basically was Western Union everywhere. <laughs> and quite frankly, it was true. They had been building out infrastructure since the 1840s, 1850s. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could find uh, telegraph circuits everywhere. It wasn't necessarily the case with, with uh, telephony uh, and the like. Oops, I went a little too far. Let's see if I can go back here. Got a bouncy keyboard. Oh, I'm getting the blue circle. Uh, uh, this is an example of a carrier system. Uh, carrier systems were uh, in regular use uh, in the telegraph industry from about the 1920s uh, through, uh, uh, through really then probably some legacy systems in the 1960s, uh, 1970s. And essentially, uh, this is again where you use uh, uh, audio frequency domain uh, methods to carry multiple telegraph circuits down a uh, pair. Um, this is an early one uh, from 1922. So that's an example, again, of maximizing circuit capacity, uh, offering economic advantages, and so on. A lot of the telegraph industry was invisible to the general public. Uh, uh, in particular, obviously, infrastructure. And quite honestly, infrastructure is still invisible to the public. I, I think if you were to take the average you know, uh, say, average citizen off the street and ask him how the gasoline uh, gets to the gas station, <laughs> he would probably, probably have no idea. Uh, you know, the, the, he'd probably never give it any thought. It's like magic. Or when he turns on the gas jet, you know, on his gas stove at home, he gives no thought to the compressor stations and the pipeline distribution networks and uh, the things that support his modern conveniences. And of course, the same is true for telecommunications infrastructure, even today with the internet or cellular data networks, people give it very little thought. And the telegraph industry had a very built out uh, infrastructure. And uh, some of the men that handled this work uh, involved in what was called testing and regulating. And uh, this is a, an example of a wire chief. The you know, wire chief's duty was to deal with uh, technical problems, patch around uh, circuits that had failed or otherwise experienced difficulty, uh, troubleshoot, uh, do fault location. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, where you have ice storms, uh, knockdowns, et cetera, uh, it would be his duty to identify how far away uh, from the wire chief's office or a, a uh, central point, you know, in the telegraph network that was. This is an ice storm in Iowa back in the 50s. And he would use devices like 
uh, impedance uh, bridges, wheatstone bridges and the like, to uh, figure out how far away and exactly where that was within you know, a certain distance, a quarter of a mile or a half a mile, so that linemen could be dispatched. And uh, wire chiefs were everywhere at uh, important railroad uh, division points and at uh, commercial offices for uh, the telegraph companies and the like. So there's a very extensive infrastructure of personnel, uh, technologies, a cable, et cetera, that's built out over a very, very long time. And it becomes very embedded and very well established. But its roots all lie in the basic telegraph circuit and manual Morris telegraphy. So it's important to maybe at this point talk a little bit about Morse codes. Now, I know you had uh, uh, Ken uh, Miller, I think it was, uh, here uh, some time back, and he touched on the nature of the American Morse code. Now, the American Morse code is what you might call the mother tongue. It was uh, developed by Morris and Bale, and uh, it uh, was the original Morse code. And it's somewhat different than the international Morse, or AKA continental code, uh, that radio amateurs use. And uh, it has some similarities, but some differences. Uh, one of the big differences is uh, the nature of the, some of the characters. Uh, so over the history of telecommunications in North America, we've essentially had four different Morse codes that have been use, in use at various times. Uh, obviously, the American Morse code was the most widely used for commercial telegraphy. Uh, the international Morse or continental code for uh, maritime, amateur radio, military, etc. And then uh, there was a competing telegraph technology called the chemical telegraph, Bain's chemical telegraph, for a time in the, in the latter part of the uh, 19th century. And he decided to use his own Morse code uh, for various reasons. It didn't last long, but sometimes little echoes of that uh, uh, code remained in the uh, two-letter call signs used on different railroads and for different telegraph offices, but it was short-lived. And of course, the Navy uh, always has a better idea. So they tried developing their own unique wireless code in the early part of the 20th century, which of course didn't last very long. But uh, as a general rule, when you're talking about Morse codes, uh, use that colloquially, uh, telegraph codes, the American Morse code and the Continental code are the two big uh, survivors. Uh, so. The main reason, so, so generally speaking, any type of commercial application used American Morse, any type of landline applications, so that would be commercial telegraphy. That's things like Western Union, Postal Telegraph, Canadian National Telegraphs, et cetera, telegrams, you know, uh, things of this nature, uh, stock brokerage work, commodities work, uh, press telegraphy, uh, you know, things of that nature all use the American Morse code. Uh, and of course, again, radio methods generally ended up relying on international code. Now, before the uh, Radio Act of 1912 and some of the international conventions, uh, American Morse was commonly used by the Lakers on the Great Lakes for wireless communications. And uh, so uh, there was some use of American Morse early on uh, for uh, maritime purposes on the Great Lakes, but ultimately, when international uh, agreements were put together, particularly after the sinking of the Titanic, and um, the Radio Act of 1912 was passed uh, by Congress, uh, you know, of course, rules had to be developed, uh, testing standards had to be developed, and it was decided that the international Morse or Continental Code, which was used throughout the rest of the world for all telegraph applications, would become the standard for wireless uh, telegraphy. Uh, so you guys use continental code, uh, commercial telegraphers, railroad telegraphers, stock brokerage operators, all these kinds of guys, uh, it's American Morris. Uh, so the reason the continental code was developed, uh, and it was developed on the continent of Europe at a convention, I believe in Berlin, somebody may correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason the continental code was developed was it had a couple of very problematic flaws. Uh, for certain applications, uh, one of which was the original American Morse code as developed by Morris and Vale did not support some of the European 
letters, you know, things with umlauts and, and, and things of that nature. The other problem was it had internal spaces in the characters in three different dash lanes. So uh, the when the undersea cables were first developed, they did not have submerged repeaters. Uh, they didn't have uh, a good knowledge of the electrical characteristics of cables and the react reactants and, and other factors that went into long undersea cables were such that on off telegraph keying was problematic. The pulses were rounded off. It did not work well. So polar keying using things such as mirrored galvanometers and sensitive siphon recorders was developed in which a change in polarity uh, indicated the difference between dots and dashes. And this process was developed for undersea cables. And so these internal spaces that existed in American Morris characters uh, were unsuited to that process. And therefore, the Continental Code was needed. And ultimately, the Continental Code was developed worldwide for all communications, be it commercial telegraphy or wireless telegraphy, except in North America. And the reason for that is the telegraph industry, the commercial telegraph industry, had already become so well established that uh, the uh, telegraph companies didn't find it practical to retrain all their operators, change their methodology. And um, basically, the original mother tongue, the American Morris, was just very heavily embedded. And it wasn't practical to retrain people and move to a new code. And it also had a bit of a speed advantage. Um, I can tell you from experience that American Morris is about 10% faster, uh, maybe 15% in some cases faster than Continental Code. And uh, in terms of circuit, because you know, circuit capacity is uh, related to uh, profitability and efficiency. So the code offered some advantages, uh, both economically and in terms of efficiency on telegraph circuits. So here's some examples of differences, right? We have, uh, for example, da 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 did is C in uh, international code. In American Morse, there's an internal space. It's a did it did. And uh, so, for example, C in American Morse is actually J. Uh, in uh, International Morris, didadadit is F. Okay. In American Morris, F is didadadit. Uh, didadadit is Q, you know, in American Morris. Uh, didadadit is R in International Morris, but R in, uh, in, uh, in American Morris is didadadit. There's a space inside. You can kind of hear it. And I'm going to demonstrate this for you here. I'm going to move this little microphone put it here on this uh, box relay. And so uh, these are these are dots, if you listen carefully. Can you hear the dots? Is that coming through OK, guys? Give me the thumbs up if it is. Yes. OK, yeah, I, I play, played with the audio settings so I could sense some more. So these are dots, and these are dashes. Can you hear the two reports? They have slightly different sound. Dots. Dashes. Okay. And so the telegrapher learns these rhythm patterns just like you do with, with international Morse, but, it, but it's a slightly different sound and technique. So, for example, this is an R. Oh, I'm sorry. Here the dit did it. Dit did it. Here's a C. It's did it dit. Did it dit. And whereas IE would be, would be a longer space. Uh, this bug's kind of goofy, but uh, so did, did it did it. Uh, why is did it did it did it did it uh, Z is did it did it did okay, do it a little slower yeah Z why is did it did it did it did it and so uh, there's these uh, internal spaces within the characters. And then there's three different dash lanes. There's T, L, and zero. Okay, so there's three different dash lanes in the American Morris code. Obviously, this would be impractical, for example, on an 
uh, early undersea cable or, or something of that nature. But there are some advantages to these spaced characters in that it does speed up transmission and it makes transmitting a lot easier. So you, you can send an entire phrase in docs, you know. See her Irish eyes, you know, it's all dots, you know, things of that nature. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of uh, the, the unique, uh, distinct differences. Uh, uh, many of the, like I said, many of the characters are different. So, for example, when a radio amateur sends uh, da 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 it, right? You know, I, I think we've all, you know, we've all, uh, uh, yeah, we've all gone ahead and, uh, uh, how many, I think most of you anyway, or some of you have operated CW, you're familiar with the pro signs, right? You know, like uh, uh, da 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 you know, for uh, end of message or, you know, end of transmission, uh, depending on how you use it. Well, really, uh, that's FN in American Morris. Da 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 is F and N is the same, da da So you're putting together fn for finished okay so it goes let's see if i can turn the volume up on this oscillator here so, okay, so this is the dot this is f you know what i think i left it unplugged uh best laid plans of mice and men but anyway uh another common one is uh da -da 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 -da. how many of you guys have, have used that right it means close of work or i'm done with my our QSO. I'm terribly sorry about that. That didn't work out as planned either. So, what did we do wrong here? There we go. So, uh, uh, okay, you guys can hear that, I assume, right? Uh, that's really three zero in American Morris code. Three is did it da da and zero is the long dash. Put them together. Okay. Uh, same with da 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 da. F n is f is n. So put them together, etc. Okay. <laughs> so that gives you uh, a little bit of an idea of the difference between the code. Uh, the numbers are also different. Uh, uh, the international characters are very. Uh, very uh, logical in their sequence, but in American Morris, it's uh, one is da 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 da, two is da 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 da, three is da 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 da, four is the same, five is da da da, six is uh, six dots, right? Seven is da 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 da, uh, eight is da 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 da. You know, nine is da 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 da, and then again zero is the long dash. Okay, I did it in tone this time to make it a little easier uh, for uh, for our ham radio guys. So there are big differences between the code, but there's also a lot of letters that are in common. As uh, with all uh, particular manual uh, telecommunications technologies, shorthands emerge very rapidly. Uh, the first one of which was the Western Union wire codes. And this was basically a group of, uh, of wire codes that some of which linger today, uh, and they had special meanings. So 73 we still use, best regards. Uh, um, train order was uh, 1-9. It was a train order not requiring a signature. They could be handed up on a hoop. Uh, Form 31, you know, it's a train order requiring signature. Uh, Da 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 da. You know, one was please wait. You know, uh, things of this nature. So we began to develop Western Union wire codes to kind of create greater efficiency. We began to develop official telegraphic shorthands, very similar to what kids do informally today with texting. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Walter P. Phillips, a founder of United Press and one-time Associated Press executive. Uh, develop what was called the Phillips Code. Uh, and some of these terms still exist today. For example, you'll hear people use the abbreviation POTUS for President of the United States or uh, SCOTUS for Supreme, uh, Supreme Court of the United States. 
uh, but there were plenty of others. You could really send a whole news story over the wire very quickly uh, using this telegraphic shorthand. Uh, YOA is years of age. Uh, YAM is yesterday morning. YAP is yesterday afternoon. Uh, TWP is tomorrow afternoon. TWA is tomorrow morning, etc., etc. I, I won't belabor the point, but early teleprinters really through the first, you know, say second, third, fourth, you know, decade of the 20th century operated rent generally at 60 words a minute. And a good press telegrapher could easily exceed that uh, speed uh, with uh, uh, the Phillips code. And uh, he didn't have to drag a heavy teletype around to, to, uh, <laughs> to a uh, press conference or a political convention or uh, a major murder trial or whatever the case might be. Uh, so uh, the Phillips code was very widely used uh, in, in uh, press uh, for originating uh, press stories, not necessarily distributing them. Uh, telegraph offices could range from uh, just a small town telegraph office like this one in Kansas. Uh, George Hack is a gentleman standing in the bow tie in the back. He worked his entire life at uh, Western Union and ended up retiring as a manager uh, Western Union manager in Florida. He's, he's long passed away, but this is uh, one of his early job postings in a small town telegraph office uh, in Kansas um, to large relay offices. Uh, relay office works a bit like a hub or a switch. Um, you have various telegraph circuits that serve different geographic areas, you know, a certain number of towns, and these basically terminate uh, at uh, these large relay offices. And, uh, you know, essentially traffic flows up, what you might call an inverted pyramid, right? And then the relay offices then uh, interact via high capacity circuits uh, uh, throughout, say, a country like the United States or Canada or whatever the case might be. So here you can see telegraph operators kind of lined up uh, you can see here the resonator, uh, of course, the mill, uh, the typewriter, the keys here that you really probably can't see. You can see the conveyor belt. So incoming traffic, you copy down the mill. Uh, you make whatever notations required. You put it on the conveyor. It goes down here uh, where a clerk um, examines the message and transfers it perhaps another operator in the relay office uh, for... Uh, moving it to a different city or a different province or state or a region. And so this works very much like, say, a switch, you know, you, you, you could say. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of similarities between what you might call the inverted pyramid of uh, the telegraph networks and the Internet of today. Um, you know, your local ISP or, say, maybe within your company, you know, your message may move from, you know, just inside the building or may move to, you know, never leave your ISP, uh, but, you know, other messages may travel across the world. And really the same kind of rule applies here in the inverted pyramid of the telegraph company. But the fundamental customer interface is always the same, right? Uh, this is, I'm going to show you a couple of quick videos here. Uh, it's in two parts. Uh, every year we do a uh, Christmas celebration in Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, the local radio amateur, uh, amateur radio club, Saginaw Valley Amateur Radio Association, uh, sets up a, uh, a Santagram event. And then uh, they collect telegrams from children. And the telegrams are transmitted over a working Morris wire to North Pole, Alaska. And um, everything's done according to commercial procedures. So in this particular first video, we see three message clerks who are collecting the telegrams from customers, in this case, mostly children uh, and their parents. So we'll play this quickly. That's a PS4, not not PFS4, just a PS4. PlayStation 4. 
And then, of course, uh, the clerks pass the messages down to the operator, and uh, the operator puts them on the wire to North Pole, Alaska. And so uh, uh, you can send yeah, maybe 250, 300 of these in an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half over a working Morris wire. So here you can see uh, them being sent uh, over the Morris wire to the North Pole, Alaska. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the process would be in a in a working, you know, telegraph office environment. Uh, clerks managing the customer interface, making sure the telegram forms are filled out correctly, uh, making sure that the standards of the uh, the telegraph company are met, uh, that uh, everything is legible and understood, and then of course uh, handing the uh, telegrams off to the operator who uh, uh, goes ahead and uh, signs a message serial number and, and, and so forth. That was the automatic stamp that I was, I was using in the process. And then of course, transmitting them on the wire, which in, in most cases would go to a relay office like the, the one you saw for Canadian National there in, in the, uh, in the uh, prior uh, telegraph file. Uh, uh, or the prior slide. So, of course, there's all kinds of uh, telegraph jobs. You know, again, telegraphy was ubiquitous, although sometimes hidden in, you know, uh, business offices and the like. Uh, obviously, commercial telegraphers, the guys that handled the telegrams, right? Uh, brokerage work. The best operators generally were the stock guys. There was kind of a pecking order of telegraph operators. Uh, st uh, brokerage operators were kind of the top of the heap. Um, handling multi-million dollar transactions, you couldn't make any errors, you had to have a boilerplate fist, uh, absolute uh, top operating skills. Um, then maybe next in line was the press telegrapher, then the commercial telegrapher, and then the railroad telegrapher uh, was uh, somewhat dependent, uh, uh, kind of the low end of the totem pole were the small wayside stations that saw very little communications traffic and mainly were just train order offices. You didn't really need to be a very good operator to do that, right? But to be a train dispatcher was a whole different ball of wax. You had to be a good operator to do that type of thing. Uh, so, you know, there, there 
there were all kinds of, of uh, businesses that used telegraphy, both internally and for, again, these specialized applications. Uh, you know, Dow Jones, E.F. Hutton, uh, you know, the Chicago Board of Trade, things of this nature. But for, for many, uh, for many telegraph employees, the entry point was as a boy, as a telegraph messenger. So over here in the lower right hand corner, we can see a youthful George Hack in his first job with the Western Union uh, Telegraph Company uh, wearing his messenger uniform, uh, maybe early 1900s from a glass from a glass uh, plate uh, uh, photograph. Uh, here you can see some uh, photos from the 1920s of postal telegraph messengers. And generally, uh, many of these boys uh, uh, used to their advantage uh, this form of child labor. Uh, they, they saw how the world worked. Uh, they learned a lot about people. They learned a lot about how businesses functioned. They got to know uh, people of influence who could help them get better jobs. Uh, some of them would go ahead and learn telegraphy uh, after hours and eventually become operators or go into testing and regulating. Uh, I've met a fair number of people over the years who were telegraph messengers. That's how they got their start. And they never complained about the fact that they worked as a child. They saw it as an uncommon education and as a great opportunity, particularly in that era before and during the Great Depression and, and the like. Uh, so we have a very simple view of what you might call child labor, obviously, in our modern world. But for many of these young men uh, working for the telegraph company, I was an opportunity to move into a skilled trade. Uh, and uh, or learn a skill or pay for a higher level of education or to support their families. So here you can see a 1920s telegraph office in Calumet, Michigan uh, on the Copper Range Railroad. Uh, and you can see the messenger boys uh, in the back and the uh, telegraph uh, operators here on the front. If you look to your left at the young, young man sitting in front of the mill. He doesn't look like he's more than 13, 14 years old. And he's a, he's a telegraph operator. And uh, the guy on the right there is probably not a whole lot older, probably, you know, 18, 20, 22 years old. Uh, of course, uh, most of us associate telegraphy with trains, train dispatching, and so forth. Um, perhaps the train dispatcher sheet was probably the first true spreadsheet. Uh, telegraph operators would OS, uh, uh, that is report trains as they pass train order offices. This allowed the train dispatcher to know where all the trains were along the territory. And then he could put trains on siding for higher priority trains. Uh, he could, uh, you know, he could order special uh, transmit special orders for extra trains that operated out of timetable authority. And essentially it was his job to track all train movements on a, say, a subdivision um, or uh, a similar section of railroad and um, also instruct those trains as to uh, where to wait, uh, where to take a siding and, and things of this nature. And he transmitted what we'd call Form 19s or Form 31s and they'd be handed up to the train on a hoop and uh, you know, uh, order for the engineer and uh, order for the conductor at the rear end on the caboose. And so the, the operator would essentially just, you know, OS a train, you know. You know, it might be something very quick, like, uh, you know, I'll make one up here in my head, but let's say, uh, Engine, you know, I forget what number I use, you know, 231 by at 10 o'clock a.m., you know, something of that nature. Uh, OS reports, they were called, and that would allow him to track when trains pass various blocks or points on the railroad um, uh, based on uh, time. You know where everything is. Here's uh, an AP telegrapher in 1967, Associated Press. Again, one of the advantages of uh, manual Morris telegraphy for press origination was the fact that it was relatively compact and noiseless. Uh, you, you take a big heavy Model 15 teleprinter onto the floor of the Republican National Convention or Democratic National Convention. Uh, it spits oil everywhere. It requires 110 volts to operate. It's noisy as can be. 
and impractical, but a telegraph operator using Phillips code can transmit a story to a newspaper or a magazine like US News and World Report uh, just as fast or faster than the teletype. And all he needs is a portable telegraph instrument of some kind, a box relay or a KOB. Uh, these are press telegraphers at the infamous Lonergan uh, murder trial, where uh, it was a big scandal back uh, during World War II when a Royal Canadian Air Force uh, 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 officer or, or enlisted man, I don't remember which, uh, murdered the, uh, uh, the daughter of a very wealthy broker, uh, part of the elite of uh, New York City, and it became an infamous uh, trial. And you can see all the operators associated with different newspapers and the like uh, that are transmitting the information back to probably New York Times and, and, and other uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, recreations of baseball games were very common, pretty much all sporting events. Uh, the, bef again, before things like microwave carrier and some of the more modern technologies, getting an equalized broadcast quality audio loop across the country was very expensive and very difficult uh, logistically. I can tell you from having been involved with a broadcast from Tiger Stadium that uh, even in the 1980s, uh, getting an equalized audio loop, say from uh, you know Tiger Stadium to Detroit to Chicago, <laughs> was was a problematic uh, procedure. Uh, fortunately, other technologies were had already emerged to solve that problem. But uh, in an era of copper long distance carriers and, and all of this type of thing, it wasn't practical. So typically, a telegraph operator would transmit the play by play at the remote ballpark. Uh, these telegraphic dispatches would be copied back at the hometown broadcast station, and then they would recreate the ball games from the telegraphic dispatches. So, uh, in fact, you know, it's kind of interesting. You can you can actually transmit play by play faster uh, than telegraph, and you can say saying it over a microphone. So, for example, strike one called. Now batting for. Strike two fan, etc. You can, you can. There's a whole Phillips code uh, for transmitting baseball play by play. Okay, uh, so uh, you know here you can see uh, you know Harvey White of Western Union transmitting uh, baseball play by play and, and so forth. Before radio broadcasting, uh, the newspapers, particularly for important games like the World Series would go ahead and set up these big scoreboards either in, either in, even either in theaters or out on the street and massive crowds would gather and they would have uh you know like lights that would light up to show which player was on base and so forth and all of this was received by a, a telegraph so you can here you can see telegraph operators at the polo grounds i i forget what year but this is by 1912 or 1914 somewhere in that range and uh, so the the telegraph and baseball uh, kind of kind of grew together. And we mentioned commodities exchanges. Uh, this is uh, I forget the gentleman's name. I think it's hidden here behind my uh, uh, behind this uh, bar at the top of my uh, thing. But this is the Chicago Board of Trade in 1970. It was uh, still using telegraph to communicate with some of the other uh, you know uh, facilities, cotton exchanges. And, you know, um, other, uh, you know, uh, commodities uh, organizations. Uh, so again, a long lived technology, some railroads were still using telegraphy in the 1980s. Uh, uh, the Sioux Line and Chicago Northwestern and even CSX had an area where they still had telegraph circuits in service in, in the 1980s. So uh, again, I, I've just given you uh, the highlights, right? I mean, there, there's so much to this. But I mean, ultimately, uh, uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, poem mythology here. I, I believe I may have missed a. Let's see here. I may have uh, disorganized. Yeah, that that slide got got accidentally moved to the wrong place. So I'll improvise on that. But of course, uh, we shouldn't. We should probably before we close the presentation talk about automation. And we touched on it earlier, but obviously the first big change in the telegraph industry was the teleprinter. 
Uh, Teletype is a trade name uh, for the Teletype Corporation. I think it was founded in 1927. Uh, the Teletype uh, ultimately began to replace the manual Morris operator. Okay, and uh, it, it had several advantages. One of which is you didn't need to have a highly skilled operator. Uh, you could employ young women, and uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, etc., you could pay women a lot less. And, uh, you know, it was uh, the um, discrimination of the day, you might say, and uh, it offered economic advantages for the industry. But the teletype offered some other advantages, too. Uh, but one of them really wasn't speed, okay, uh, or necessarily flexibility. Uh, there's really not a lot of difference between you know, 40 words a minute or equivalent uh, 60 words a minute with things like Phillips code and the like, and a 60 word per minute teleprinter. But the big advantage was you didn't have to have the skills, right? Um, it was much easier to find a good typist, a good secretary and trainer to use a teleprinter. The other advantage of teletype was that it very efficiently supported automation. So we began to see things like paper tape storage. Uh, we began to see perforators and reperforators, where uh, communications traffic originated by a teletype could be transferred to a, uh, a paper tape using, you know, the Vado code, and it could be transferred to a different circuit automatically. And uh, you began to see methodologies that use the store and forward type function. Uh, also things such as concentrators and uh, burioplex, where uh, instead of having just certain offices on a dedicated circuit, you could have a trunk of circuits and you could switch uh, teletype traffic to whatever circuit was available, okay? And therefore keep these circuits more busy or more heavily loaded and therefore promote greater speed of throughput and greater efficiency and so forth. So we start working on things like you know, multiplexing and concentrators, and that's also called varioplex and this type of thing, where uh, we began to switch communications traffic to the first available circuit. And I say a trunk line between two relay offices or on a transcontinental circuit. And we began to be able to greatly increase or multiply the circuit capacity and the amount of communications traffic that we can send. And this increases speed, efficiency, and incorporates economics and so forth and automation. So in reality, you began to see the emergence of these large switching centers, particularly with Western Union and AT&T. There's a Western Union uh, uh, switching aisle here in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And here's uh, you know, basically the uh, uh, transmitter distributors and, and paper tape uh, methods being used. Uh, this is probably the 1950s, mid 1950s. And so you can kind of begin to see the emergence of the internet, right? Uh, you're beginning to see this process of how communications traffic uh, is handled through first uh, mechanical automation and then later data processing type automation. And then eventually what we do is we simply break communications traffic down into packets and then we switch the packets around and reassemble them using data processing at both ends. And the telegraph industry kind of pioneered a lot of these methods, particularly for specialized systems like the uh, Federal Reserve System and the uh, Department of Defense's auto DIN and, and things of this nature. So I'm going to give you some really bad news here. I hope I don't, don't disappoint anybody. But Al Gore did not invent the Internet. I know it's going to come as a big shock. Okay, um, uh, Al Gore was not the, the inventor of the internet. Uh, the internet in many respects evolved out of, uh, or on the foundation of many of the automation techniques that the telegraphing uh, companies implemented using, you know, teletype machines and these types of switching centers and concentrator methods and microwave carrier and, and, and multiplexing and, and the like. So, uh, you know, most technologies don't exist in a vacuum, right? You know, they're built on ideas and foundations that originated um, a long time ago, and it's part of a whole evolution. So uh, as we look back on this whole history of uh, telegraphy and, and telecommunications, 
uh, I want to go through some myths and complete the complete the circle here. Uh, I know people are probably anxious to, to go to bed. Uh, some myths. Uh, the telephone did not make the telegraph obsolete. Uh, the two technologies existed or coexisted for a long time. Telegraph offered uh, reliability, um, economics, uh, better long distance capability for many years, well into the 1950s, uh, better multiplexing capabilities, and of course, repeatability, speed, accuracy, et cetera. And again, even the phone company found itself using telegraphy for its internal communications. So when you read like certain books, like the Victorian internet, which doesn't specifically say it, but nonetheless infers through context that as soon as the phone was invented, the telegraph became obsolete. That's really a, a terrible uh, misinformation based on omission, maybe not a purposeful lie of omission, but a misunderstanding of the evolution of technology. Uh, obviously, because of this, the telegraph didn't disappear, say, in 1890 or the 1920s or the 1950s. Uh, it lingered for a long time, um, not just due to economic advantages, but in later years, legacy systems hung on uh, for quite some time, simply because all the infrastructure was already there, particularly on railroads. Uh, railroads were pretty much the last users in, in, in uh, years. Uh, as we've discussed, uh, Morris wasn't slow and inefficient in the hands of skilled operators. Uh, uh, and using you know advanced techniques, it was a fairly efficient method of communications, and I think hams know that intuitively. I certainly don't have to say that. Just for your edification, let's talk a little bit about some common instruments. Obviously, the telegraph sounder is the electromagnetic device that reproduces the dots and dashes. It's not a clicker. It's not a clacker. It's a telegraph sounder. That's the proper name for it. <laughs> Uh, resonators. Uh, a resonator is basically a box that you install the sounder in to channel the uh, telegraphic you know, uh, report from the, from the sounder toward the operator. And it, it tends to soften the report too a little bit, like a, 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 say the, the resonator on a guitar or the sounding board on a piano. I don't think I'll spend too much time on keys other than to mention the bug emerges about 1905 and the, uh, or the Vibroplex semi-automatic key. And interestingly, the Vibroplex emerges at about the same time that reasonably priced mass-produced typewriters emerge. And in many respects, it's one of the things that lengthened the life of the telegraph industry, the ability to transmit uh, telegraphic traffic much more quickly uh, for extended periods of time, combined with the ability to transcribe that high-speed message traffic on a mill really lengthened the life of the telegraph industry well into the mid 20th century uh, because of those two influences. So the bug was a very influential device uh, in uh, the telegraph industry. Uh, relays, uh, some were for fixed purposes. The box relay, uh, like in the lower right hand corner, you, know, you might think of as the laptop computer of its day. Uh, it was both a port portable instrument that could be used in any variety of applications. And you might see these types of devices at press conferences and murder trials, you know, and things of that nature, uh, uh, like these portable devices, uh, KOB, sounder and key on the same board. There was an AT&T set from the 1960s from the phone company on the lower right. Uh, another one from the phone company on the left over here. I know these were very common you know, back, back in the day. Uh, switchboards are very simple uh, devices. Uh, see these in most telegraph offices. This is a small switchboard from a, uh, a simple telegraph office. Uh, and then you would see very long ones that covered a whole wall in big uh, commercial telegraph offices in the big cities. Um, and just some uh, telegraph uh, devices. Uh, this is a messenger call box right here on the left. This device is called a secret sounder. This came from the Washington DC Western Union office and it belonged to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, personal telegraph operator. Uh, and uh, it lives in a, a glass display case here in the shack. Uh, this is a telegraph battery called a crow's foot battery that was used for many years uh, in telegraph service to provide a battery. And uh, then of course up here is a lineman's uh, pocket set. Uh, 
pocket relay, it's often called. And so these are some uh, other examples of port uh, portable telegraph instruments. This particular guy here is designed to uh, cre recreate the sound of a telegraph sounder in an earphone uh, so that you wouldn't disturb uh, viewers and listeners, say, at a presidential press conference or something like that, something important. You know. And over here is a telegraph operator's badge from the 1948 Republican National Convention. Uh, and again, another example of a Western Electric uh, KOB, uh, Polar Relays, this one here is from uh, AT&T Bell Labs, uh, they analyzed the, the nature of the uh, British Post Office uh, relays for comparison, uh, constitutions from uh, the Order of Railroad Telegraphers Union. There's all kinds of historical stuff uh, out there that's, that's pretty fascinating to understand. And we don't have the time, unfortunately, tonight to go through all of it. Uh, final lessons before I let you guys go. Uh, that is uh, lessons from the telegraph era. Well, first of all, uh, there's a lot of similarities between Western Union and Microsoft. I complain about Microsoft all the time, but let's face it, Microsoft did a lot of good in terms of standardizing software applications. The Western Union monopoly did the same. Uh, they ensured that you had universal telegraph service. You could walk into any office. The message formats were the same. The procedures were the same. And you can send a message pretty much to any city or to foreign countries, et cetera, uh, through a very efficient system. And so uh, the concept of monopoly or regulated monopoly really emerges with the telegraph industry. And of course, it has pros and cons. But ultimately, this model has supported the creation of a lot of our infrastructure uh, throughout North America and uh, throughout our uh, you know, first couple uh, centuries of our existence right, as, a, as an industrial society. Uh, one of the lessons from the telegraph industry is that uh, all new technologies uh, bring with them uh, undercapitalized companies, uh, stock manipulation and fraud, uh, overvaluation, those of you that remember the internet bubble of the, I guess it would be the 1980s, 90s, uh, will probably also know that a very similar process occurred in the early days of telegraphy. And it was also repeated in the early days of radio. Uh, you know, the stories of, for example, Frederick Collins and uh, Lee DeForest and their run-ins with stock manipulators and, and uh, almost ending up in jail and the like over uh, excessive promises and, and uh, uh, people investing in technology in hopes of getting it rich and so on. Finally, I think the last lesson and perhaps the most important one is if you look back on the telecommunications technology of the past, it's really only a value as a force multiplier in that uh, technologies allow businesses to function more efficiently. Uh, they improve their economic uh, standing in many respects because they lower operating costs, they eliminate people, they simplify processes and so on. But ultimately, when it comes to telecommunications technology, uh, it really does not create wealth. It's only a value in that it allows you to facilitate processes that create wealth. In other words, it's a mechanism within wealth creation. It's not wealth creating in and of itself. And if you don't agree with that, I would challenge you to ask if why, as predicted in the 1980s, we're all not sitting in internet cafes, making money uh, uh, texting celebrity gossip to each other. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, if you look at the internet revolution and its impact on the broader economy, it uh, has made some people very rich, but ultimately it has not become a substitute uh, for the wealth creating capacity of manufacturing, uh, nor has it offset the lack of wealth creation and distribution and equity in the body economic that has occurred due to the export of technology and capital investment to China and Asia and so forth. And uh, you see this is demonstrated in the um, lack of opportunity, lower wages, and so forth that have occurred for many workers, uh, say, in recent decades. 
So in reality, the quote unquote new information economy that was promised by certain politicians in the 1990s, uh, you know, they offer the belief that it would replace the old manufacturing economy, economy really hasn't worked very well for us. So telecommunications is great. Uh, it has its place, but it's not really a substitute for the methods and uh, activities that create wealth, you know, mining, agriculture, high level manufacturing and the like. Some final thoughts uh, for you hams. Uh, and my, I'm ham myself. Telegraphy is unique. And that is both technology and an art form. And I think that's one of the things that makes it lasting and fascinating to many people. It's certainly unique in its historical context. The telegraph operator had a unique position in our history in that all the important news and information of the day passed through his hands. And uh, that will never occur again. Uh, and of course, finally, little is new in history. Uh, we simply forget about the past. And again, I could talk for five or six hours on this. So I think that brings us to some level of conclusion here. And uh, at this point, uh, what time have we got? Uh, I look over my shoulder. It's been about an hour and 20 minutes. So uh, I tried to keep it about as close to an hour as I could. So I see there's some chats up here. Uh, let me see what's, uh, what's going on here. Uh, OK, a comment. Uh, let's see, Tom. W3TDH, uh, I have a comment on dual code operations. Uh, are you there, Tom? Do you want to uh, maybe uh, uh, say something? James, can you lower your desktop, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, forgive me. Uh, yeah, let's see, uh, stop share. Okay, is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. So now I can actually see this better too. My comment is that uh, our radio club got to see a presentation about the women telegraphers of World War II. And some of the veterans got to attend, uh, this was decades ago, but um, one of the jobs they filled was coast operators in coastal stations. And this one operator after the formal presentation sat down and says, who's your hot lick? And we called Bill over and said, Bill, this lady would like to talk to you. And she says, give me a string of your best. And Bill rattles off at something like 40 words a minute. And she's not only writing it down as Bill sends it by hand. She was sending it in American landline telegra telegraphy, only two or three letters behind it. And, and I looked at the lady and said, how on earth did you learn to do that? And she said, well, when you've got a merchant radio operator begging for army air cover to force a Nazi sub to dive so that they can outrun them and live this sale another day, that's called an incentive. So I thought she'd want to know about that piece of history. Right, These ladies right. could just switch hands and send in two codes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, in, in, I, I think that uh, maybe some hams here may uh, be able to re relate to this, and that is ultimately telegraphy becomes a language. Okay, so if you ever watch translators on television, you'll see them translating. Say uh, they're translating Russian to English, right, during a, a news interview, and they're just a couple of words behind, right, and they're they, they're kind of doing this process in their head. And ultimately, you know, I, I can even say from my own experience, uh, I've uh, I've been. Uh, uh, checked into uh, radio telegraph nets uh, and international Morse while simultaneously uh, operating American Morse uh, from uh, the desk opposite me, you know, kind of simultaneously. And, you know, you can go back and forth between the two codes. Um, and so I, I can see where that would happen. Uh, it was fairly common for uh, coastal operators actually to do that type of thing. Um, you know, the, the real experienced ones for whom telegraphy had become a language. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, all good operators eventually reach the point where telegraphy is just a natural language, like speaking English or being bilingual and, and say, you know, French and, and English or whatever the case might be. We had a gentleman in our club who uh, uh, told the story about a, a gentleman he worked with in Montreal who could received two telegraph messages simultaneously in French and English and copy them simultaneously. 
but you know, left and right hand on two different message blanks, you know, and, and things of that nature. Uh, my predecessor as international president of the Morris Telegraph Club was, uh, she's still alive. Her name's Levina Shah. She lives up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, Levina worked as a telegraph operator during World War II. And uh, they sent her to all kinds of lonely outposts as a 17 year old girl uh, with uh, nothing but a hand pump and an oil lamp and a converted box car to handle train orders, uh, you know, uh, all by herself, you know, during uh, during World War II. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of interesting stories out there. And one of the goals of our organization is to collect those stories and those firsthand accounts. And we do publish accounts like that in our, our quarterly journal entitled Dots and Dashes, uh, which we publish four times a year. Let's see who else here has a comment. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Jim, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, I have uh, lost your picture for some reason or another. Um, my computer just went to an entirely different screen, an entirely different subject. I, I don't know what happened, but I see I don't see anybody, you or anybody, anymore. But I, but I had a I had a question. Um, many you and uh, probably many of the other more telegraph club uh, people here. Uh, no, I'm doing a paper, or actually a book, on uh, the history of uh, the first telegraph company in Texas. And uh, along with that comes a, a question, several questions that, gosh, I have a plethora of people here who might be able to answer all of this. But very briefly, um, I have learned through the research that I've done for this first telegraph company, you, know, you have to do a lot of broad thinking and, and broad research to, uh, to write even a narrow uh, text on something. But I, I learned that railroad and telegraph did not really get along for the first few years. They could, the railroad considered a telegraph along their right of way to be uh, a, a hazard to their rolling stock. And it wasn't really until after the Civil War that uh, telegraph really had much to do with, with railroad. Is, is that what you guys have found? I never really did really discuss it with anybody. Well, I, I think uh, you're, you're off a little bit. The the uh, originally, yes, the, the railroads, uh, railroad obviously provided the ideal access for setting poles and distributing oh, without a doubt. the infrastructure yeah, without and all, a doubt. right? Uh, and the, but the railroads and the telegraph did grow up together. The first train order, and I, I could be wrong on the exact year, I think was transmitted by a railroad superintendent named Charles Minot in 1851. And hopefully I'm correct on that. But that, uh, you, that you can look it up. would have been New York and Erie Railroad? It, I believe so, yeah. yeah uh -huh. okay. it, it happened up in, in uh, upstate New York anyway. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that was uh, the first realization of the railroad industry that the telegraph offered the benefit of being able to control train movements and not have sure. to operate solely on timetable authority. And from that point forward, uh, the railroads began to adopt the telegraph as as a you know what you might call their force multiplier, right? You know their ability to more efficiently manage train movements and so sure. forth. So I, I would say the process of the railroads realizing the potential of the telegraph really started before the Civil War. And of course, by the time the Civil War comes along, uh, they fully understood the implications of the telegraph. Well, it seemed to have been true, yes. Uh, I have one, Father, one, one additional question. Uh, in, in my research and writing about this first telegraph company in Texas, that was Texas and Red River Telegraph, by the way, formed in 1853. I have a lot of original data on that. But it went all the way to Galveston, crossing Galveston Bay from the mainland, which was about two miles, and uh, actually about three wire miles. And uh, we are curious, and there is no documentation available anywhere that definitively identifies the manufacturer of that cable or what it looks like. Uh, was it just a cable core? Or was it an armored cable, as was the uh, you know the longer cables in other places? We believe it was uh, 
manufactured in, in England by the Gutta Percha Company, and it was just a cable core. But there's other stories that can be uh, very compelling as well. Have you or anyone uh, else around here developed any kind of thoughts on that? I haven't. I, I can't really point you to anyone. But, you know, part, part of the thing that we've kind of discovered in, try, in terms of preserving this history is how much is actually lost. That's right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've gone back, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of work on, uh, on uh, Spielberg's Lincoln, you know, on the movie. And, yes. uh, and the, the uh, uh, going back and kind of understanding telegraph procedures in the Civil War, there's really not a lot of recorded history on that process. So you had to dig through archives right of actual messages and look at the notations on them and figure out okay how did they handle group counts you know how did they yeah. transmit messages what were the procedures etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot of these things that you might call nuances or mechanics or technical details they get lost over time as people pass away uh, and you know uh, even now you know our organization uh, we're not producing any more telegraph operators, right? We're not producing any more, you know, uh, oh, testing and regulating ham. that. That's, <laughs> That's right, exactly. And and, and hams, uh, hams have developed kind of their own distinct culture, which has drifted quite a ways away from the traditions of the telegraph industry. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons we exist is to try and preserve as much of this information as we can. But certainly when you start digging back into the mid 19th century, there's just a tremendous amount of information that's been lost. That, that, that's true, and, and, and we, I'm monopolizing this here. I don't really mean to do that. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways I've, I've found that a lot of this was lost, for my particular line anyway, was through 19th century courthouse fires. And uh, other things were just simply not recorded uh, for one reason or another. So there's a lot of things that, that I've had to deal with, but I'm so glad you touched on things like uh, uh, tangential telegraph uh, equipment, such as fire alarms and police alarms, because that was that was one of the early outgrowths of, of telegraphy. And th things like that are just not known. And I do cover some of that in my book. So I'm uh, really trying to do a great job of that, plus some tangential things. Sounds good. Yeah, the a lot of people uh, still uh, have security systems provided by ADT, and I think they give little thought to that the fact that ADT stands for American District Telegraph. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, bank alarms and, you know, things of that nature that was uh, conveyed telegraphically. And right. again, if we had more time, I could tell you some funny stories about you know, some of these older municipal fire department systems and so forth, where young technicians have gone out to try and service these things that have no conception of how they work, nor uh, of the basic electrical theory on which a telegraph circuit, you know, the principles of operation of a telegraph circuit. But we, we can't digress too far because we'll run out of time. Here no, and, and you really yeah, talk with someone right. else, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank so, you, Jim. We really I'm, are. Uh, well, Tom, you got your hand up. You want to go ahead? Yes, sir. Um, to this day, since he said we're not producing telegraph operators in the city of San Francisco, if you want to qualify to be a chief aide, which is the first step on the promotion ladder, you have to be proficient in telegraph code. The chief aide stands at a firebox with a weather code above him and transmits orders back and forth from the telegraph alarm office, which is still an active service in the city. Uh huh. Interesting. Now, I know Chicago had a you know an old school fire alarm telegraph system into the 1990s and uh, i believe motorola came out to replace it with something high tech and uh, uh the motorola system had so many problems they went back to using the the old you know old style telegraphic system for about another year or two i think it was until motorola could get all the bugs worked out but uh yeah certainly uh you know these old fire department systems you know they uh, they uh, they were pretty reliable. There's some good YouTube videos, uh, uh, one or two anyway, that show some of those old uh, telegraph central offices, you know, associated with uh, uh, you know, urban fire departments and the like. It's a whole different topic that, you know, I, I don't want to dig too deeply into here. Uh, and nor am I really an expert on it for that matter uh, in, in any regard. But, but it is a pretty fascinating history. Uh, Dan, is there any other uh, 
hands raised. Hands, right. Put it in the chat area. There's a couple of questions. What, what was the international code used? Uh, no, was it international code used by the British during World War One? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the international code would have been used by the British in World War One and Two. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see here. Uh, there's a mention that Ronald Reagan was proficient in the American Morse Code. I'm not sure if that's actually true. He recreated ball games, but typically the telegraph operator would be dispatched to the radio station, and he would write the play-by-play -play on slips of paper and hand it to the announcer, whose job it was to recreate games. So these great sportscasters like Ernie Harwell and Red Barber and so forth, they weren't telegraph operators themselves, but they worked with the telegraph operator uh, to recreate the games. I, I think the same was true for Ronald Reagan. There is a uh, 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 recording on the MTC website uh, with Reagan and uh, Red Barber and a, a couple, I think Ernie Harwell is there and a, at least one telegrapher. You can go to the website and listen. And Reagan said he was within a half a pitch of the action on the field. Uh, I think his uh, telegrapher was uh, Curly Waddell. I, I suppose Curly was actually bald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it, there's some good photos out there of of you know the the process going on. You know, at these uh, newspaper offices where they recreated the games before radio, and then of course post radio era and so forth. And Ernie Harwell and Red Barber both talked about it in interviews. You know about how they recreated games and and so on. By the way, Chris uh, here uh, who who just spoke is vice president of the Morris Telegraph Club. So I should introduce you by your your title, Chris. You know. Uh, <laughs> what's your call again? WB2, TLL, the tough luck lover. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, Chris, I, this is Darrell. You, know, you and I have been uh, communicating quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're doing a lot of jumping in and out here. We're going to start doubling with each other if we don't uh, start raising hands or, or doing something here. <laughs> Uh, is, is there any more questions? I don't see anything more in chat unless you do there, James. I don't see hands raised. Uh, see, somebody asked Z and C are the same in continental code. No, uh, they're da 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 da. I don't know if there was an error or something that he saw in one of the slides, maybe. Uh, yeah, Jim, there was an error that you had the C as Z. If you look at your that slide, you'll see you. Oh, okay. A little error in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, is there anything else that you see there, James? Uh, no, I think that's probably, I think I've kept you guys long enough here. I said, uh, there's a few comments here. Uh, somebody said, I read a book that World War One operators could translate code at 120 words a minute. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I've got a, a, a number of books here uh, from uh, first-hand accounts from World War One operators, and uh, and I think they pretty much operated at at least the uh, ones for the Allo Allied Expeditionary Forces operated at normal commercial telegraph speeds. You know, uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 words a minute. You know. Okay. I um, any more comments or questions here before we try to close this out? Let people go to sleep. Yeah, uh, I had, uh, this is Darrell, I, uh, I had one comment uh, uh, for Jim or anybody. I've often thought that uh, the 911 operators uh, should have a method, either be required to copy Morse code or have a method of copying Morse code. I've called them several times for myself when I had uh, the inability to speak, basically. And boy, if I'd have had a code oscillator, I sure could have communicated a lot better. Yeah, so, yeah. Now yeah, we're a real small subsegment of the population there, Darrell. So, indeed, yeah. it is. Uh, Jim, <laughs> that was a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. I, I tried to stuff 50 pounds of uh, salt into a five pound bag, but you know, I did my best. <laughs> wonderful program, really was. Thank you. Yeah. It, it was, and you did a great job. I appreciate you doing that for us. Um, you're a great speaker. I'd like to see you come back again. Okay, one last call. Anybody got anything here to add, subtract, or multiply? Yes, I do. Um, towards the end of his life, Edison was nearly deaf, and people around him had learned to communicate with him 
in Morris by tapping on his knee. So people in his family and so forth were often telling him what was being said instead of his actually hearing it, according to several biographers. Yeah, there's uh, there's a recording of Samuel Morris trans, or I mean of uh, Thomas Edison uh, Thomas Edison transmitting Morris, and uh, uh, we have a recording of it there somewhere. I know Chris, you've got a copy of it, and I do here somewhere as well. Uh, but he tr he recorded a uh, uh, transmission to the telegraph fraternity in the early nineteen it was the nineteen tens, I think. Uh, so uh, yeah, he was. Uh, Supposedly a very good telegraph operator, certainly a, a genius in terms of developing telegraph technologies like the stock ticker and uh, and uh, you know the the you know quadruplex telegraph things of that nature. Yes, uh, Larry, you got your hand up there. Uh, yes, sir. I was just wondering. Uh, I know uh, they uh, brought a lot of the uh, female operators in during uh, World War II. Uh, probably also for the commercial and stuff like that, but were they relieved like they did uh, the Rosie the Riveter type peoples also at the end of World War II when all the GIs came back? Or do you know? <laughs> well, I, I do know that, you know, my predecessor stayed on in the industry for some years, I think into the 1950s afterward. She continued to work in the telegraph industry. Uh, I think primarily in commercial telegraphy uh, for, I forget which, uh, they might have been Canadian National or, or one of those. Uh, but uh, I, I would imagine that there were some cases, particularly where there were union uh, issues, where, you know, returning GIs may be based on, you know, seniority date, were able to displace uh, the women operators. Uh, Chris, do you have any knowledge of how that process worked? Uh, no, I've not heard anything. No one has said anything to me about uh, being displaced. Like, and I know Lavina worked into the 1950s, as you said. I know she said she was rather proud of being, I guess, the official Canadian receiver of the uh, inauguration of President Eisenhower from the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lavina is an interesting woman, uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, so she stayed in commercial telegraphy, copied press, you know, did all that kind of stuff into the 50s. So clearly she kept her job. But again, it may have been based on things like union agreements and, and things of this nature. The railroad was uh, one of the early uh, you know, uh, areas of union organization, uh, order of railroad telegraphers, commercial telegraphers union, uh, things of this nature. There, and again, there's a, you could put a, we could do a whole talk for an, another hour and a half or two hours on union organizing and, and uh, the telecommunications industry, so. Okay, let's do a little, little shout out here. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Oh, I'm, okay, hi. <laughs> if, um, <laughs> am I still on? You are still on. Okay, I can't tell if my mic was muted or not. I've got a strange picture here, never mind. I wanted to, uh, to ask Jim uh, or anyone, uh, and during my writings here, uh, some of my reviewers have asked, uh, what about women telegraphers? Not so much women telegraphers. We know they were there and thankful for them. But what about black women telegraphers and uh, other things like that? Anyone have any thoughts or knowledge on that? Well, I can tell you this. Um, the Sadly, um, the... Generally speaking, the telegraph industry is a very honorable profession. Uh, I'm going to tell you stories of great honorable acts by telegraph operators. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. if you look at the constitutions of the Order of Railroad Telegraphers, say from 1950s or 30s, uh, it's very clearly states that any white man or woman and the blacks were excluded in, in many respects from from the profession now how much of that was driven by the southern contingent you know in the jim crow era yeah. uh, versus you know uh, say the northern contingent i don't know but but unfortunately you know that the discrimination did exist as a matter of fact uh oh uh, uh chris who, who i wish i could think of his name he was a terrible racist down there in Mississippi or Alabama, who was a former telegraph operator, and he became, uh, he was uh, like a public safety commissioner for the state, and he, you know, he came down really hard on the civil rights protests in the 60s. Uh, 
Do you remember his name? I don't know why I can't think of it. He's he's not uh, notorious as a telegraph operator, but he's notorious for what he did during the civil rights era. But he worked for the railroad as a telegraph operator at some point in his life. You know, so there were bad people in the industry, just like any other industry. But you right. know, yeah, it's okay. Well, thank you, Jim. What's that receiver behind you with the uh, beautiful um, half moon dial in the middle? That looks like a Hammerland of some kind. Oh, up, up here? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, that's a Helicrafters SX-28. It, okay. Oh, I couldn't see it as that. I'm quite familiar with the 28. Okay. Yes, it's not illuminated, of course. So, you know, yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, an SX-28. Okay. Very good. Well, <clears throat> you can't see my ham station behind me, but there's a Viking adventurer in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a Johnson Viking one there in the corner with uh, paired with a uh, I don't know if you can see it with uh, an SP oh, yeah. 600, you know. Oh, yes, yes. And, and the old, um, you know, Remington uh, Mill and, you know, oh, uh, some other things. Uh, hiding back there, you know. Uh, Very so. good. Okay, I'm going, to start this, I'm going to start cutting this short. We're going yep. off topic and we're approaching the two hour thing pretty fast. So uh, yep. let's close her down. Now, then, for those who would like to, I leave these things open. So after I close this down, if you want to come back and just chat with each other, just come right back in like you did the first time. It's still open to do that. So anyway, uh, 73 is everyone. It's been a great presentation. Again, thanks, uh, Jim. You did, James, you did a great job. 73 is everybody. Thanks, Dan. Have a good night, everyone. Oh, James, can you send me your, your slideshow, please? I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep, sounds good. Take care. Good night.